Hello, I'm Bill Parker, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the first in what we hope will be a series of webinars brought to you by NASD and our preferred suppliers. With us today, we have Pete Mazzilli and Sean Baer with PSI Group. PSI has been a preferred supplier since 2019, and we're extremely glad to have them. They've been uh, excellent members. Uh, Pete Mazzilli is Director of Marketing and Business Development with uh, TSI Group's Bioactive Ingredients Division. Throughout his career, he has specialized in finding new markets and applications for commodity materials and creating value-added products and services. He joined TSI in 2020 and currently manages global marketing for the Bioactive Ingredients Division, as well as sales for North and South America. Tom Bayer is Head of Business Development for MCI Biotech, a subsidiary of CSI Group. Uh, he was a research scientist with MCI from 1997 until 2003. And in 2007, he returned to the company as Director of Sales and Marketing. In 2019, he became Vice President of Business Development for TSI's Innovative Products Division, a role that he holds today. His responsibilities include new business development, uh, R&D management, and identifying and acquiring new technologies for commercialization. And without much further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Pete and Sean. Um, as a matter of information, uh, feel free to uh, ask questions throughout the, the presentation and uh, using that Q&A uh, functionality that you have down below. And we will address as many uh, questions as time allows. Uh, once the presentation is done. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Pete and Sean. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Bill. Uh, one moment to uh, share my uh, screen. Okay, thank you, uh, Bill. Thank you uh, to the NASC for this opportunity. So I'm gonna start uh, uh, talking about uh, joint health uh, and, uh, and glucosamine. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll spend a couple of minutes, uh, you know, just on sort of the clinical background of glucosamine uh, and, and joint health. So you know, we all, I think, are pretty familiar with it. And, and we know that, uh, uh, you know, joint health is important to overall health. If, if we or our animals, our companions can't uh, move uh, pain-free and uh, with full range of motion, uh, we're not going to move around as much. We're not going to get as much exercise, and that just sort of cascades uh, in in, uh, in terms of, of being able to to live a healthy, uh, you know, pain free life. Uh, but we know that uh, glucosamine uh, as, is a supplement, but it's also naturally produced in the body. Uh, it's a vital building block uh, of cartilage, uh, which is what helps us and, and our animals to uh, move freely. Uh, we know glucosamine levels fall. Uh, naturally, uh, as we age and as animals age, um, and you know, and as a result, cartilage uh, begins to break down, and uh, that's what makes movement more painful and, and, and more difficult. Uh, historically speaking, there's there's been a lot more uh, clinical research on the impact of glucosamine as a supplement on the human side as opposed to the animal side, uh, and I think this is sort of a common refrain uh, that uh, supplements uh, are, are applied. Uh, humans uh, take them and, and they make their way over into the animal world and, and become accepted as, uh, you know, as, as uh, ways of, of treating similar, uh, similar issues within animals. Uh, and so glucosamine really is, is no exception to that other than the fact that in, in the 1970s, glucosamine really was first injected uh, into horses. So technically speaking, I guess it really did start on the animal side. But uh, uh, when you get into the early 90s, when it was when it was developed as a um, as a as a as a powder and widely produced, uh, it really was for human consumption, uh, which is now uh, obviously spilled into um, or, or moved its way into animal supplementation. Um, a few just sort of um, uh, 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 clinical studies uh, that we referenced that took place uh, in a 10 year span between 2007 and 2016. Uh, these are all human uh, clinical studies. There's, there are a lot of them out there. These are a few that we uh, tend to, to reference when, when discussing this kind of thing. And uh, so studies that showed improved uh, knee flexion uh, and extension, uh, reducing uh, the uh, CTX2 levels, that's the fragments of collagen uh, that, that serve as biomarkers for degradation of, of collagen and cartilage. And collagen is really the protein that, that uh, makes up cartilage. 
uh, decreases uh, uh, the risk of uh, glucosamine supplementation uh, has been uh, studied to, to decrease the risk of developing knee osteoarthritis and also reducing uh, type two collagen degradation and, and also maintaining synthesis. So those are just some uh, studies that we, um, that we reference. Uh, you know, we live in the world of, of dietary supplements. And so we're always limited on, on claims that we can make and, and we're all used to, to living in that world. Uh, and so much of what we talk about is really more about what consumers think. It's more about uh, you know, eye of the beholder or perceptions. And uh, you know, if people uh, feel that it's effective and they will take it. And uh, um, so we spend a lot of time and a lot of resources uh, surveying consumers and understanding their attitudes specifically towards glucosamine. And uh, some of these are the, the surveys that I'll reference here today. Uh, some of them are third-party surveys that we've participated in or they're, they're publicly available. Uh, a few of them, particularly the animal ones, uh, we've conducted ourselves uh, towards the end of 2020 and early 2021. Uh, we kind of, we focused a little bit on dog owners. Uh, future ones may, we'll certainly expand that to, to other animal people who, who own other animals or other types of pets, but uh, uh, the, just full disclosure, this is when I reference pet owners in our surveys, I'm really talking about dog owners. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the surveys on human uh, supplement uh, takers, uh, users, uh, you know, that shows that they've experienced benefits, they claim uh, experienced benefits from taking glucosamine, or at least believe in its effectiveness. And um, the, the research that uh, we did of dog owners uh, shows that nearly two thirds of them recognize the benefits of glucosamine and, and have given this uh, supplement to their dogs. Uh, and then we know and we see animal supplement brands continue to develop new glucosamine based uh, products. Uh, there, are, there are a number of uh, ingredients out there that have been in use, uh, MSM and chondroitin and, and so forth. Uh, there's CBD and, and eggshell membrane are all products that are being clinically studied for joint care. Uh, and what we see is not that they're really there to replace glucosamine, but to uh, augment or, uh, or complement glucosamine in, in, um, in, these types of, in these types of products. So that's, that's some of the development that we're seeing on our end. Uh, just to uh, talk a little more about the technical side, uh, you know, there's not a lot of hard and fast clinical data to tell us what a, a proper dose is for uh, animals. Um, most of this is based on uh, the human uh, recommended uh, dose is 1500 milligrams per day. Uh, and it's, it's somewhat proportional to, the, to, to, to weight to the size of the animals. So dogs uh, can be anywhere from 250 to 1500 milligrams a day. Horses um, uh, much higher and, and we're seeing a few more products uh, that are targeting uh, cats and uh, felines uh, for, uh, for joint care as well. Um, so, and, and again, animals age more quickly than we do. And while you might have people uh, taking um, uh, uh, glucosamine at an older age, generally speaking, particularly for dogs and horses, uh, it's, it's recommended to, to begin at a, at a relatively young age uh, to allow them to uh, to exercise uh, pain-free and, and, and to function uh, and, and, and as our companions. So the, what, I, what I really wanna uh, focus on uh, for the rest of, of my part is, is where glucosamine comes from and, and how it's sourced. Uh, you know, historically speaking, uh, well, the glucosamine is, is made from a building block uh, called chitin. And uh, this is a material that exists uh, in nature and most uh, prominently or most accessibly is uh, in, in the shells of, of shellfish uh, in certain fungal biomasses. And uh, so that's uh, developing the chitin that can be turned into glucosamine is really the, the basis for how uh, this product is made. Going back to the early 90s when it was first uh, produced as a, uh, as a dietary supplement, uh, the shellfish uh, process was what was used. And um, that's what glucosamine uh, really came from for a very long time. Still does today, but um, exclusively uh, for, for many years. Uh, and then the drawbacks uh, from this type of glucosamine, uh, people with, with kosher or vegan diets or shellfish allergies couldn't consume. 
uh, and and more prominently, uh, especially now, is um, is that the process just requires uh, a tremendous amount of water, a tremendous amount of heavy heavy chemicals in the process. Um, it produces large volumes of, of hazardous waste, whether that's wastewater or, or solid waste. And it, it's just not a very environmentally friendly uh, process. Uh, around about 20 years or so ago, uh, the process of extracting chitin from uh, citric biomasses, which is a, a, a um, byproduct of citric acid production, uh, addressed uh, the shellfish concerns as far as human uh, consumption but didn't really do a whole lot to change the environmental impact of, uh, of making glucosamine. And uh, my little flow chart there at the bottom, that's the shellfish process, how, how many different steps there are in uh, alkali uh, addition, whether it's leaching or cooking or acid leaching, you know, all that adds uh, hazardous uh, chemicals to the process, all that contributes to the hazardous uh, waste that comes out of the process. So. In short, it's just not a it's not a very environmentally friendly process. Um, you know, several years ago, and and this is commercially available now, is is um, uh, a much newer, uh, cleaner process that was developed, and um, it's it's uh, creating glucosamine uh, from glucose, and uh, and often referred to as direct fermentation or fermentation vegetal glucosamine, vegan glucosamine at all, uh, generally refers to the same uh, process of um, uh, extracting uh, glucose and then turning that into glucosamine. Uh, as a raw material, glucose uh, comes from corn or it can be produced from corn. And uh, the resulting glucosamine that comes out is the exact same material um, that's, uh, that's produced from shellfish. Uh, the uh, production process, however, dramatically reduces uh, the environmental impact. And uh, when I say dramatically, it's, it's dramatic. Uh, this little graphic here kind of lays out uh, what it would take or what it does take to produce a, a metric ton of glucosamine HCL uh, in terms of inputs and, and output waste byproducts. Uh, and the, the volumes are, are staggering when it comes to uh, the amount of water that it takes to make a ton of, of a shellfish based glucosamine. Uh, the citric biomass process requires 45 tons of HCL and produces 25 metric tons of, of solid uh, hazardous waste. Uh, so as you can see, the shellfish is a little, other, rather the citric is a little bit better in some areas and a little worse than the other, but overall both processes are pretty, um, uh, are, are pretty harsh. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, it's a pretty uh, obvious contrast with uh, what uh, is, is put into and what comes out from the uh, direct fermentation or the glucose uh, derived uh, glucosamine. Um, if you look at this really carefully, I, we use this graphic a lot and I like it, uh, but you'll notice uh, if you look at it carefully enough, it's not really drawn to scale. You know, it tells the story and, it, and it, it, it's pretty clear to see the point that we're making, but I always, um, I want to see things really more to scale. So um, it took a minute to put this slide in here um, just to really drive the point home. Uh, the, the glucose direct fermentation uh, uh, bar there in gray is really imperceptible. If you look to the left, you can see little slivers of gray there. That's how uh, the environmental impact, whether it's on the amount of raw material or water or acid that has to go in or what's produced in waste, that's how it, it stacks up in proportion to uh, the other two processes. And just you know, converting some of that data into some numbers that, uh, uh, again, uh, emphasize the point uh, making a, a glucosamine tablet from a shellfish derived glucosamine generates five and a half times its weight in solid waste. Uh, it takes nearly a billion gallons of water to produce enough uh, shellfish glucosamine to meet the, the demand here in the US. Um, glucose uh, versus shellfish reduces the water use by not quite to zero, but by 99.6% and the solid waste production by 98%. Acid input is reduced by nearly 90% and the production and treatment requirements for uh, caustic soda, sodium hydroxide is also dramatically reduced. So what does all this mean? Uh, you know, back to, uh, it's all about the consumer. It's all about uh, the perception. And, uh, you know, we can say, you know, it's not really just good for the planet, but it's, it's good for business. And, you know, a lot of our surveys uh, asked about consumer attitudes uh, towards uh, green or sustainable or, or, or how products are sourced. 
So that first bullet point is, uh, is glucosamine users uh, on the human supplement side in general. Uh, you know, 60% of, of those respondents uh, say they're willing to pay a higher price for a product that is sustainably sourced. Uh, that number jumps to 82% of, uh, of, of dog owners in our survey. 55% uh, of, of the dog owners uh, checked 10% uh, or higher premium that they would pay for uh, a product that's, that's again, sustainably produced or, or green. Uh, that last one there uh, refers to sourcing not necessarily uh, just sustainability, but transparency, understanding where the, the, the ingredients come from. Uh, three quarters almost of the respondents uh, cited that as an important influence when uh, choosing supplement products for their pets, uh, which was interesting to me that that scored higher than uh, the option that was veterinarian recommended. Uh, we've we've taken these numbers, uh, these surveys globally uh, across uh, Europe and, and Australia. Uh, the numbers are, are scored a little bit higher than the, than the U.S., which uh, really kind of hangs with some other surveys that we've seen in terms of consumer attitudes towards green or sustainable products. Uh, Germany, in all these surveys, always scores a little bit higher, uh, and and this the surveys that we uh, we took here are no exception that uh, clearly there is, a, um, there's a, there's a desire on the part of consumers to, uh, to buy products that, as, as, we, as we often say or hear, are aligned with their values and more specifically uh, when it comes to environmental impact and, and sustainability. So, you know, looking forward uh, on glucosamine in particular as, as, a, as a supplement for joint health, uh, we expect glucosamine uh, use to, to grow in the animal supplement market. Uh, I don't know that uh, that's any uh, great forward-looking statement. We know in the, in the last uh, year of, of COVID, pet ownership has, uh, has spiked. Uh, we, we're all in this industry. We've all, we've all seen uh, growth uh, in terms of demand for pet products and, and pet supplements. Uh, forecasts that are out there, whether it's on pet products or on supplements or glucosamine in particular, over the next five to 10 years range from three, three and a half percent growth rate to as high as you know seven or eight percent. Where that actually falls is you know remains to be seen, obviously, and it's just a forecast. But uh, you know, our own personal uh, experience uh, as a manufacturer of glucosamine, and, and we're we are the largest in the world, and so we just see that our uh, share of the pie that animal supplements or animal uh, uh, base glucosamine is taking uh, continues to grow in, in our world. And, and uh, human consumption of glucosamine has been flat for a number of years. And so the share of what we ship out that goes into the animal uh, uh, industry or the animal world is, is, um, is, gaining, is gaining steam every, uh, every year. Uh, the other uh, point is that uh, glucosamine from glucose or direct fermentation uh, will continue to overtake uh, glucosamine from shellfish uh, manufacturing due to increased environmental regulations. So the demand for shellfish glucosamine is still very high, uh, but uh, it was, as we know or probably know that uh, much of it is made in China. And, uh, and over the years, uh, there's been a lot of pressure from the Chinese government on industrial operations to clean up their act and, and glucosamine uh, part of the industry is, is certainly not exempt from that. So that pressure will, uh, we feel, uh, push more and more production towards direct fermentation or uh, glucose-based uh, uh, manufacturing of glucosamine. And so uh, it's an opportune time really for brands uh, to capitalize on the sustainability messaging. We feel there's a, there's a window there of a few years uh, where uh, if, if you're on this now, and talking about uh, your commitment to the environment uh, by utilizing a product that is uh, much more environmentally friendly, that there's an opportunity to kind of separate yourself from, uh, from the competition. Now, the, the other uh, opportunity, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of other uh, raw ingredients that um, are being uh, studied and looked at in, in conjunction with uh, glucosamine. And as I throw it to Sean for, uh, for his part of the presentation on HMB, uh, we do feel that that's, a, um, that's, that's one area that uh, should be, uh, uh, that, that folks might wanna take a look at, which is a combination of joint and, and muscle health. 
and specifically for companion animals. So with that, I'm, I'll throw it to you, Sean. Great, thanks, Pete. Appreciate that. Bear with me one second while I share my screen. Great, thank you, Pete. And uh, I also wanna thank Bill and the rest of the NASC team. Um, really appreciate everything they've done over the years. We've been member, um, as, as Bill noted, for quite a few years, whether it be at the uh, exhibiting at the hall, um, which you know, we'd all like to get back to a sense of normalcy on that aspect to be able to gather and, and meet, but we just really appreciate it and, and point to the fact of the importance of membership. Um, that's something that uh, Pete and I talked about with Bill and um, I think it's really important to point out that I know there's people on the call right now that aren't members. I just want to encourage everybody to join if you can, um, because we, you know, I think what NAC is doing right now with this um, a preferred supplier um, webinars is incredibly intriguing. I think there's a huge opportunity for us as an entire group to uh, meet this way for the, for at least for the time being this year. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about muscle health. Um, and specifically, we'll talk about a nutrient that's beneficial to muscle health, HMB. Uh, bear with me one so I have some technical difficulty here. There we go. Um, so from a standpoint of muscle health and, and just what we know about it, um, when we kind of take this position, we're going to look at it from the standpoint of, of the human side, and then we're going to talk about how it's applicable across our companion animals. Um, as we all know, um, you know, muscle is just another one of those important categories um, of health, whether we're talking about joint health, cognitive health, um, bone health, it's all very interrelated, but it's many times been overlooked, um, the muscle health category. Um, specifically, when we start talking about longevity, um, we forget how critical a role muscle plays in, in that ability to have quality of life, mobility, and ultimately that strength and function side. So it, there really is um, no single feature of age-related decline more striking than that decline in lean body mass that affects our overall muscle health. Um, Dr. Rosenberg said this years ago, and I think it, it really is important to point this out from a standpoint of, of how it can impact that quality of life and longevity. Um, it really is more than just proper nutrition and activity. Uh, it really comes down to an inevitable decline in muscle health as we age. Uh, simply because uh, with muscle, we know we lose it. You know, we talk about osteoporosis and bone health, but not everybody will experience that, nor do all of our pets experience bone density changes. But it is inevitable. We will all experience it as will our companion animals as we live longer and longer each, each generation. There's this uh, gradual decline in our, in our muscle health that needs to be addressed much, much earlier than what we're doing. Um, from a standpoint of kind of what it looks like from a graphical representation, we really see in this, and I'll, I'll try and guide you through this quickly here. On the, the left-hand side here, we have what is considered muscle mass for that capacity, that functional capacity. And then we have age. If you notice age, we really don't have it quantified here because when we talk about, as you'll see in future slides, when we talk about the health and the age of companion animals, many times we look at it as we always hear, you know, dog ears or cat ears and we've tried to make it relative. So without putting a scale on here, what we're really looking at is what happens in early development and then adult life. Unfortunately, we all experience this. Um, once we reach the age for humans, about the age of 30 to 35, we start seeing a decline in muscle health. This is a gradual decline, and there are impacts that can, that can have rather big um, sways either way. Um, for example, if we have proper nutrition, exercise, uh, really have avoided um, you know, serious illness or injury, the curve, as you can see, stays more on this high side on the, the white bar. And if we've experienced things, and unfortunately we've experienced it this past two years really, of what's happened with COVID, for those that have had it, have had these events where you see dramatic loss in muscle mass. And it's even more critically important to get back to a, a normal range, if not the optimal range, at least somewhere in here, where there's a quality of life or function that's maintained. Because once we reach this critical line of a disability threshold, that's where we see things in humans where there's an inability to perform the daily tasks that, that we may enjoy or, or might even turn into more of a necessity side in terms of walking, um, uh, standing up out of a chair, self-care, those items. And we see that with our companion animals as well. 
from the equine side all the way to the smallest of, uh, of canine um, breeds, we see issues with muscle health that a lot of times are reflected in mobility. And as Pete pointed out, there's a combination here of not only muscle health, but also that joint health to tell that full mobility story. So as it notes here, a couple of critical points, really this, this, this process of aging, um, there's an altered uh, muscle metabolism at play. Um, we see this, whether it be the pathological side, or we simply see the aging side of, of what happens to health, whether it be a disease or condition or the simple act of aging, we see these small changes in muscle health. When they add up over the years is where we see this, this overall inevitable age-related decline, ultimately resulting in um, changes in quality of life and changes in our ability to perform functions that we, we really want to see. But how does this relate to our companion animals? And something that's interesting in the, the uh, WSAVA um, textbook or toolkit, if you will, they use this illustration to really show what happens, um, the process of sarcopenia or muscle loss in an aging animal. And really there's, it's a very simple process in terms of muscle loss, but we all see it as a detriment to function because many times it's overshadowed by a gain in weight and that weight gain is actually fat gain. So although in this illustration, we see severe muscle loss illustrated through the decline in mass that's related to muscle, unfortunately with the diets, many a times we're seeing it overshadowed by a replacement with fat or fat composition. And like humans, muscle loss is inevitable with age in, in our companion animals. Um, really, we see the impact on mobility and strength, which ultimately results in function. And this, this loss really can eventually lead to a point where it impacts morbidity and mortality rates. And again, I, I alluded to this before, and I just want to point it out again, you know, that since our pets age relatively more quickly than we do, it's important to ensure they receive proper nutrition and activity. So it's that impact early on in life that can have the benefit later in life. Uh, we see it a lot of times with, um, with, our, with ourselves or our parents even, we'll see a point where they've lost a step or we've lost a step or feel like you can't perform daily function, like something as simple as carrying groceries in from our car, we might notice it there. But for our pets, we tend to, to not see it until, I don't wanna say it's too late, but until there's been a dramatic change. Um, whether they simply have troubles getting up a flight of stairs or going for a walk, they might stop earlier or, um, or, or even refuse to go for a walk. Or for example, on the equine side, um, they you notice activity declines. When they get to that point, the experience of muscle loss is on the scale that would be much, much farther down this range into the point of, I don't want to say disability, but approaching that. So what can we do to intervene is really coming down to looking at nutrition. We know there's a compound, um, HMB. It's a metabolite of the amino acid leucine. It stands for beta-hydroxy, beta beta-methylbutyrate. Um, it's been scientifically shown um, in numerous studies in both performance humans, so the exercising, bodybuilding, and that side. Um, it's been shown in the clinical nutrition side with products that are aimed at maintaining muscle with things like cancer, cachexia, AIDS-related wasting. But we also see it in the longevity side in, in, in muscle health and products like Abbott's Insure, where they're really trying to maintain muscle as we age. Uh, but many of, the, many of the studies we're gonna use as examples initially here to show this age-related decline are on the human side, but based off of our performance data in humans, as well as performance data in, in canine and equine, we know that the physiology of, of what's going on with HMB is, is follows through and not just in the human side, but also in the companion animals. So how does HMB work? You know, HMB is very unique because we know nutrients can have an impact on protein synthesis. But where HMB works very special and uniquely is it also works on the protein degradation side. So as this, this nice little illustration shows here, what we experience is a constant state of synthesis and breakdown in our muscles. So if we can have synthesis be greater than breakdown, we get a net gain. And inversely, when breakdown is greater than synthesis, we get a net loss. And obviously when they're in balance, we have maintenance. Unfortunately with age, what we see is an actually decline in that protein synthesis at the same time, we see an elevation in protein breakdown. So it's both sides of that equation start to become in a mismatch and there's an accelerated muscle loss. But what's unique about HMB again is the fact that we can actually work on both sides of that equation 
maintain protein synthesis, reduce protein breakdown for a net increase in muscle mass, or at worst, maintenance of muscle mass. And next, we kind of look into the importance of protein. On the human side, we hear it all the time in, in marketing and in the media, how important you know, protein is as a nutrient. Uh, although it's, it's, it's akin to the same kind of concept as you know, protein is delivering these building blocks. And if we don't have the right machinery turned on for these building blocks to be used, there really is no benefit to additional protein in the diet. The same thing goes for our companion animals. We know we really look for the right kinds of protein in, in the diet, make sure for equine, we look, make sure the grains are balanced so we have the right amount of amino acid blends. Uh, in, in, in canine and feline, we know we look for quality protein. But what's really important to realize is that we also add a nutrient like HMB, where HMB can help us utilize that protein. Because if we turn on the machinery for protein synthesis to build, we better have that protein available. And vice versa, if we're adding extra protein to the diet, we better have HMB available to, to make sure that machinery is turned on. So what do we know about HMB from a result of, of you know, the science side in the human application? We've seen over time, there's a very consistent um, set of data that shows that HMB increases muscle mass and increases strength in an aging population. Uh, in this case, we were looking at specifically, um, and this was an older adult study, we looked at changes in, in more function. So if you look at it from a knee extensor force, that's the ability to extend the leg or extend the lower leg. Knee flexor force is the ability to bend that lower leg and hand grip strength. When you look at it as a functional index, you see a very consistent improvement in function, which is a, is a uh, uh, marker, if you will, for changes in strength and muscle health. We also see an improvement in function in terms of mobility. This is a very interesting uh, test. What this test is, it's called the get up and go performance test. And in older adults, it's often used as a reference for the ability to get up and move across the room and return back to the seat and, um, and return back to the seated position. And it's a very standardized test. And as you can see with age, we know that there is a, a rather significant decline. The average person uh, probably on this call, if we were to test everybody, would probably fall into the six to eight second time frame to do this test. And when we look at an aging population, it can be as much as 10 to 12 seconds. In this study, the placebo group and the HMB group both started at roughly that 10, um, 10 and a half second time period. But with HMB over a, uh, over a, um, a 12 week time period, we saw a reduction in the time it took to perform this test, ultimately showing an improvement in strength and function or muscle health for these individuals. Next, we looked at a, 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 we're looking to look at a study that was done for 12 months, because it's really important when we look at acute studies or even, or even um, like a study as, as little as four to 12 weeks, that it might have an effect, but it doesn't really play out over the course of a year. We really want to look at this longer because that nutritional intervention, as we know with aging, it's, it's not just a snippet of time. It, it's, it's, we're really hoping to, to capture a longevity component. So with that said, we looked at this similar demographic of, of older adults, looking at it over 12 months. And what we observed when HMB and vitamin D are combined together, and vitamin D I'll, I'll touch on briefly um, after I go over this data, but when we hit, see this combination of these two nutrients um, over the course of, of 12 months, we see an improvement in function as well as leg strength, even without exercise. And you know, it's very easy to say you know, exercise can have an impact on um, increasing protein synthesis in itself. But when we take that exercise component out of it and look at HMB and vitamin D on a nutritional intervention only, it's remarkable to see that the functional index on the individuals did not receiving the HMB vitamin D combination remained about the same, so no change over a 12 month time period. But there was dramatic improvement in that function, similarly in, in strength. Now, the reason why I wanna to touch briefly on the vitamin D component here is, you know, we have done studies in the past with HMB and we had seen uh, a group of non-responders, if you will. And what we found is that there was, there was always an increase in muscle mass with HMB. But once in a while, you wouldn't see that similar improvement or magnitude of improvement in function. And in recent years, I would say the past 15 years, we've become much, much more aware of the importance of vitamin D outside of just bone health. We start getting away from preventing deficiency 
that would cause things like rickets and looking more at sufficiency in that higher uh, vitamin D levels. And when vitamin D is sufficient, we see improvements in cellular function and things, everything from um, oncology research, cardiovascular health and muscle health, we see an importance of vitamin D um, for function. So when we add vitamin D to the equation, we no longer saw those non-responders on that function and strength side of things. Uh, we received a, a similar benefit, if you will, that we observed in mass changes we saw in function and strength. Next, we're gonna to shift to um, studies in, in, in the canine model. And these were exercising or performance related canines. So in a Greyhound study, and again, the reason why I'm sharing this is that we know that HMB works in the performance side and the longevity side, as well as the clinical setting. And the data we have in canines and in equine tends to be in the performance environment um, because the, it's a condition that you can really observe like we've done in the past with human um, studies. You can really observe changes in muscle health and, and output. So looking at our first study we had done with greyhounds, and this was completely a performance-based um, study looking at training for you know, the, the racing environment, we observed that HMB had a net decrease in this key indicator of muscle damage. Creatine phosphokinase is, is an enzyme that exists inside the muscle cell. And when we see it in the blood or plasma, we know that there's been damage has, has occurred to that muscle fiber. So if we can minimize that muscle damage during training, we know that there is a improvement or overall integrity to that cell health of the, of the muscle cell. So with HMB, we saw a, re, a reduction in, in this creatine phosphokinase as well as an improvement in red blood cells. And what does that really mean? Well, we know that it has probably a reflection of that increase in, in, in protein synthesis and redu reduction in protein breakdown. But more importantly, it's also having a training benefit on the cardiovascular benefits of, of exercise. And we see that in both human and animal models. So with that, we, we, we observed these changes in the muscle health and more importantly, the performance of the animals during the training. And that outcome really led to additional research in Iditarod uh, or in sled dogs during the Iditarod training phase. Another, another part of this uh, uh, canine study with greyhounds was that HIV supplementation reduced um, race time. So it's one thing to have these biological markers or physiological markers. It's another thing to see it actually return in terms of function or performance. And as you can see, um, the, the changes after 12 weeks, there was a significant change in training. So these um, animals were, were matched, if you will, from when they started the study to after it was done. And we looked at performance time at the beginning of the study and performance time in races after they had been on supplement. And what happened was a rather significant improvement in, in, in performance time, because as we all know, uh, you know, looking at the Olympics, we're watching you know, the swimming last night, seconds, fractions of a second make a difference in performance. And clearly in this model, we saw similar benefits to what we observe in, in the human side with performance enhancement from training with HMB. Next, we looked at the overall, we look at this as more of, of the health and um, the ability to train at a high volume for the sled dogs. Leading up to the Diderot, it's an incredible amount of training volume there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of muscle damage. And with HMB, what was observed was a, a continual improvement in overall muscle health as a reflection of reduction in muscle damage. So again, that marker of creatine phosphokinase was reduced, that, that muscle enzyme that shouldn't be in the plasma, we saw it gradually decline during intenser, more intense training. Um, and similarly with lactate dehydrogenase, which LDH is another indicator of intense training. So in both of those models, when the training was the most intense, we saw the greatest reduction in, in these markers, showing that HMB had this protective effect, if you will, by reducing that muscle damage and improving cell health. Um, in the equine side, we see similar benefits. Um, this was, uh, again, we're looking at performance animals here. Um, these are indicators of aerobic performance. We saw an improvement in red blood cell count, uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit in, in the racing, uh, uh, horse racing model. Um, these improvements really go right in line again with what's been observed in the human side as well as canine. Um, it's incredibly important to note that when we look at these, these improvements, 
that these improvements are, are also impacting overall health. We see it, in, in, again, in, in humans. Um, it's not just about improving muscle health. It's also about overall health and, and longevity. And finally, with the uh, additional study in 48 thoroughbred horses, um, and again, the dose obviously is, is fairly high here, five grams um, per serving, two servings per day. We see improvements in several indicators of, of performance or optimal aerobic performance. Increases in globulin, um, white blood cell, red blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit. Um, but again, we also see this reduction in creatine phosphokinase. That should be phosphokinase. I apologize, there's a typo. Um, the, again, that muscle enzyme that we don't want to see in high amounts in plasma, we see a reduction. Again, showing that that HMB is protecting that muscle. So with equine, similar to what we observed in canine, we see this increased indicators of aerobic uh, metabolism. We see uh, improved uh, condition to allow the, the horse to run faster. Uh, we see that it, 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 there's a tendency for it to decrease muscle damage, allowing for faster recovery between training bouts and overall improved performance from a race time. Again, this followed through with canine. So HMB is one of the most clinically validated nutritional ingredients for muscle health on the human side. We know this. Again, we, we cross several consumer demographics on the human side from the, uh, what do we consider more of the traditional fitness bodybuilding sport nutrition market to the active nutrition uh, person who's looking for more of that lifestyle out of activity or that active lifestyle. Um, and then in the clinical nutrition and then obviously healthy aging, HMB has been well documented to improve muscle health. But when we look at the animal side, we see that there is this equal importance to muscle health story. Um, as an animal ages, we wanna maintain that muscle so they maintain their function. And as Pete alluded to, when we see changes in joint stability and joint mobility, uh, we also see changes in health. Um, we all know the, the, the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. Well, when an animal is, is activity levels decline because of pain or discomfort in a joint or loss of stability and strength in the muscle, we see this decline in health. So what many consumers are looking for, and we know it um, from a standpoint of ourselves and we see the market on the, on the human consumer side, we see tremendous interest in maintaining that muscle health. So we see this trend really moving into a similar interest in the uh, canine and feline and in equine area where maintaining that muscle is critically important so that the animal um, really doesn't, I don't wanna go down the pain threshold, but doesn't see that change in quality of, of life and, 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 and output in terms of an activity. So really what we're talking about today and in, in, in what Pete's been alluding to in, in his um, a presentation on glucosamine and, and what I'm talking about in, in this side of it is that complete joint muscle um, kind of solution, if you will, to uh, quality of life and longevity. Um, joint health um, really is that um, innovation um, from glucosa green brand, glucosamine, and muscle health support being from the MyHMB brand of HMB. And with that, Pete, uh, do you want to touch on your final points here? Yeah, I appreciate that, Sean. Thanks. And uh, yeah, to be sure, you can you can um, source uh, direct fermentation or glucose derived glucosamine not from TSI. That's not glucosa green, but we we do have a very strong brand uh, in 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 the uh, glucosa green or the vegan glucosamine that we supply. Um, we uh, call ourselves the glucosamine experts. Uh, we, we're the largest manufacturer of glucosamine uh, on the planet. We have uh, R&D that's dedicated to developing uh, better ways of processing uh, glucosa green into uh, finished dose, uh, whatever, whatever might be desired. Uh, we do, we've, we've uh, uh, financed cl clinical studies for uh, glucosa green for things outside of joint care, uh, muscle health, gut health, brain health. Uh, and I, I just don't know that there's a, another uh, supplier with the transparency uh, and the uh, expertise and the, the amount of years of experience that we have with this, um, with this product that would uh, be able to support it in, uh, in, in a way that would uh, help uh, you folks with any kind of co-branding uh, that you'd want to do uh, with, with this powerful brand, Coast Green. I did misspeak before. I, I said that uh, vegan and vegetal and uh, 
direct fermentation are the same, but that uh, um, uh, citric biomass could be considered vegan and vegetal. So be careful if you are sourcing uh, to, to be sure that uh, whatever, wherever it's coming from, that it's made from corn and via direct fermentation. That is the, uh, the process that is the environmentally friendly process that we talk about. So thanks for your attention, appreciate it. And with that, I just want to end with the My h &B is the brand of h &B that is offered through TSI uh, and Metabolic Technologies. Uh, the, the joint partnership really came from a combination of the um, research and development that was done at Metabolic Technologies and the really the um, TSI strength in manufacturing and the quality assurance that comes with that in the years of uh, research and safety data that backs the TSI My h &B brand. Um, it's been used in all of our safety and toxicity and efficacy studies, as well as the trusted history of quality and supply. Um, we really do want, you know, obviously to make, you know, the My h &B part of your solution for that mobility um, product, joint stability, um, really is that combination of, of joint health as well as muscle health. And with that, um, we really appreciate everything that uh, Bill and, and Jenny have done to help us set this up today. And with that, uh, Bill, do you want to uh, field the questions? Yeah, you bet. We'll jump right into the questions here. Um, I'm going to do my best to uh, address these in the uh, order that they came in. Um, but the uh, first question is, uh, speaking of perception, horse owners think glucose and corn is as evil. Do you have any recommendations? for how to educate and market this new source of glucosamine to them. Uh, some, uh, some already don't give glucosamine because it's glucose plus animal and their horse can't, can't have uh, simple sugars or starches. Hey, that's a really good question. And I, I don't know that I have a, a, a real satisfactory answer uh, for that. Um, I, I think that's, that's uh, I'm sure one of the reasons why uh, shellfish glucosamine continues to, um, uh, to, to have some popularity is, is, is that um, uh, association with, with sugar or, or glucose uh, in, the, in, the, in the product. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, 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 not, that's not a question I can really answer directly uh, for you. I, I think it's um, one of the reasons why we probably will never eliminate shellfish-based uh, glucosamine, but, but the uh, the overwhelming majority will will shift towards um, the uh, the um, glucose based glucosamine over time. Okay. Um, next question: uh, Is there a way to test which source glucosamine is from? Are there ways? The question, uh, Bill. I'm sorry. Are there ways to detect how it's sourced? Is there a way to test uh, which source the glucosamine comes from? Yeah. 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 So there are um, there are DNA type tests that can um, that that can uh, determine. Uh, there are you know there there's uh, there is a company out there that that uh, has uh, their own testing protocol that they they um, uh, do themselves. Uh, but you can also access a, a lab you know that's that's available for you to um, test uh, to know for certain that uh, what you have was either sourced from shellfish or from, from glucose. And it's an interesting question because, you know, there are suspicions that, um, there, that, that there's some direct fermentation glucosamine making its way into the market under the label of shellfish-based glucosamine. So it's, it is an important question, you know, particularly for your labeling or for concerns as, as that previous question about equine uh, to, um, uh, you know, to, to make sure and to ensure that's the source. But yes, there are there are tests available and you know, via email or, or whatever, I could certainly put somebody in contact with the lab that we've used in the past to, um, to do that. And I'll go ahead and send you their contact information after yep. we're done here. Yep. Uh, next question. Uh, does producing glucosamine from glucose derivative affect insulin uh, sensitive animals? Yeah, that's another question I'm going to have to... Uh, um, uh, research. I, I do not know the answer to that question, and I think it is an important question. Um, and I think this is going to be uh, uh, directed at the, the, the studies, uh, uh, Sean. Uh, does the timing of the HMB intake influence its outcome? E.g., were the patients taking 
the two gram in one taking in the morning or rather spread along the day or some other spacing? Yep. That's great. a great question. We, we see that a lot in the human side as well as in the, in the animal research um, side of things answering this question. Uh, really, it comes down to maintaining blood levels. Uh, but it's, it's I, I think for the most part, it's the daily supplementation is, is fine in, our, in terms of, say, for a companion animal, if they were to be fed just in the morning. Uh, but ideally, two doses um, are best. As you probably noticed in the, uh, the one equine study I pointed out, there was a split dose, so two five-gram doses. Um, I'll just say that for the most part, the dose is a roughly around 38 milligrams of calcium HMB per kilogram of body weight. So obviously, depending on you know, the dose for a horse versus a dose for a small dog, obviously very different. But when you put it on that 38 milligrams of calcium HMB per um, kilogram of body weight, it kind of equates things out. We typically see for a, say, 60-pound dog, about one gram. And again, if the individual or if the product was being formulated, for once a day, that would be fine. Um, in timing relative to exercise or timing relative to performance, ideally we'd like to see you know, the blood levels rise prior to uh, performance or prior to exercise, but more for the importance of taking this product for muscle health and longevity or that quality of life, it really comes down to consistency on a daily basis. So if it could be split into two doses, great, um, but you know, one dose um, every morning one dose every night, something like that would be very um, beneficial, but a lot of our data is based on a split dose. Okay, thank you. Um, for the canine and equine story studies, was they can be used alone or in combination with other ingredients? Um, for the canine and equine studies, those were done, I would say alone, but obviously they have normal nutrition. So the diets were, were typical, whether it be for chow or it be alfalfa pellets um, or, or typical feed for the uh, equine. We use alfalfa pellets with and without HMB for the equine study. And for the um, canine study, it was a, a kind of a powder electrolyte mix that's used already in those, um, by those trainers. And they just added the HMB into that blend. Um, so really nothing that was observed in one animal and not the other. So only change in their diets was the HMB component. Are you aware of any studies in aging equine? Um, no, we only have anecdotal. Um, and I'll just share with you, we've had people that have been lifelong. <laughs> Years ago, we had a product called Beta Advantage and it was an HMB alfalfa product we put out as a company. Um, we got away from that. We moved more towards the R&D and then obviously the supply of the ingredient. But for a long time, we had customers that would still reach out to us about aging um, horses that had been using HMB and, and they were taking HMB from, say, the GNC store for more of the sport nutrition product and putting it into the feed or putting it into the water for the horse. And so, again, no research base, but the anecdotal data was response was very positive. Uh, we'll just say that extrapolating it from the human side, um, we see a very consistent physiology here on protein synthesis and reducing protein breakdown. And it just makes sense that this would carry over into equine, um, canine, feline. Is it possible to get uh, the citations for the HMB studies? i uh, wondering if it's uh, possible to recreate them in horses. So for the, the horse studies, yes, th those are actually published. And that's something that we will work with NASC to get that out. Bill, I assume we can do that. Yep. Absolutely. Perfect. So we'll work okay. with the team there to, to help facilitate that. Absolutely. Are these products soil soluble? Uh, for example, uh, if added to um, MCT uh, and or hemp oil, for example. Pete, do you want to touch glucosamine first? Uh, yeah, glu glucosamine it, it can be a challenge uh, to, to dissolve in oil, and uh, you know we've had we've had a few um, uh, instances where we've uh, done some research on our end to try to help uh, customers, uh, you know, get where they where they want to be or where they need to be to to put this in some kind of an oil. Uh, and again, that's something we can certainly support and use our uh, technical folks to to try to. Um, 
to try to help you. But the, the short the short answer is it's it, it is a challenge. Water soluble, yes. Oil not not uh, yeah, is, is challenging. And for HMB, there's two forms of HMB. There's a calcium salt of HMB, and that one I would probably say if you're trying to put it into an oil. Um, it might be a little challenging. It's, it works great in water. Um, it's used in the dietary supplement side um, in, in you know, pre-mix, um, RTDs, uh, ready to drink uh, beverage. Uh, it's also used in powder drink mixes. Um, so from that aspect, you know, it performs great in, in tablets. We also have a form that's HMB free acid, which um, obviously is not the salt. It's just the free, form, or the free natural form of HMB, which is a liquid. Um, we haven't really tested it in terms of will it separate on the shelf um, from a, an oil, but in theory it's a liquid so it should mix. Um, it's just there's a small, very small percentage of water, which it may have, it might have some issues we might have to work with you on um, if there's interest there. But uh, just for the sake of kind of like similar to what Pete said, we, you know, it's more of whatever we can do to help facilitate the process to learn whether it, it is compatible and works, we're, we're happy to, to help the process. Next question, uh, do you have bioavailability studies for the corn-based glucosamine? Yeah, good question. Uh, the, the, I, I, again, the short, the short answer is, is, is yes. You know, it really resides in our um, grass uh, affirmation uh, that um, that we had to uh, uh, you know, perform for development of this direct fermentation uh, glucosamine. So it's not the, the full report is generally not something that that we share. But but again, we can have we can certainly have a discussion on on some of those details. But uh, uh, you know, again, the short answer is yes, we do. Okay. Well, confirming that both of these ingredients are approved for animal pet use in the USA, and also are they approved in Canada? Product. Go ahead, Pete, if you want to answer on glucose. Well, uh, yeah, the question was, are they approved for animal use in the United States and Canada? Yes. Uh, the, the United States, yes. Uh, in, in Canada, um, you know, I, there's, there's, there are some, there are some questions, but, but I, about uh, uh, the fermentation process that we're working our way through as far as the uh, Canada regulatory. Um, and that's something we can follow up on. And, and uh, this is this is this is Bill Bookout. I don't know yeah, if I'm but... coming through. So the the answer to that question is glucosamine and HME are both only approved for use in dosage form products. They're not approved for use in animal feed products or nutritional products. <laughs> Canada has a program, the Veterinary Natural Health Products Program, the ingredients need to be on the list of acceptable substances, the LAS list. There's information on that program under the members section of the website. Fema Van Ness gave a presentation in 2018. So sorry for jumping in, but grass, I just wanna emphasize grass for humans doesn't mean grass for animals. Grass is species specific, okay? Everybody who's an, and everybody who's an NASC member should know that, but I suspect the question came in from an attendee who's not, who's not a member. That's just my guess, but so I wanted to chime in. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, Thanks, Bill. And yes, to, to what Bill just said about HMB, that is, that is accurate. In the U.S., it can be used as a, as a, as a supplement in the companion in the animal space. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, uh, are there MSN or chondroitin sources that are considered sustainable if one were to blend with glucosamine and market as sustainability source or sustainably source, excuse me? Yeah, uh, well, on the chondroitin side, there's, there's exactly one. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's um, uh, manufactured in Europe. It is, it, it's, it's, it's very expensive. So it's not one that, that we see a lot of. Um, uh, uh, my, my chondro, uh, well, um, the name is escaping me at the moment. I should know, but uh, um, it is the only one that uh, we're aware of that is a um, a, a, a truly uh, you know vegan. And I don't know, you know, to, to, I'm not even sure if the process could be considered sustainable in the same way that, in contrast, of manufacturing between 
you know, uh, you know cartilage or you know uh, bovine shark or or, or porcine versus um, you know I'm not familiar enough with the process to know if it's a, a sustainable or a green quote unquote process um, that could be marketed. Uh, MSM I'm not uh, familiar with any that um, uh, that that would be considered uh, uh, green or sustainable. Thank you. Um, uh, with that, um, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, end the questions. I've got a couple left, and uh, uh, Pete and Sean, I'll go ahead and email those to the both of you and uh, have you reach out uh, with the contact information, and I'll have you reach out uh, to these folks with answers for them. Yep. Um, and I'd like to uh, go ahead and thank everybody who uh, has put this uh, presentation together, uh, Pete and Sean. Uh, but on the on the uh, on behind the scenes too, uh, uh, Jenny Rector on the NASC side, and uh, Sylvia Hodeferda, and I hope I pronounced her, her name right, guys, uh, on the TSI side. Uh, everybody uh, worked really well together, and uh, information flowed back and forth really well. So I I really appreciate you guys working with us on this.